Today is Tuesday, November the 27th in the year 2012, year of our Lord. I'm Matthew T.G. I'm Heath Mulliken. And I'm Tony Casey. What is this year of our Lord thing? <laughs> Welcome to the Techology Show, a weekly podcast featuring technology, theology, and everything in between. This is episode 100. And 82. Heath, Woo-hoo. big football game in South Carolina this wanna, week. I don't want to talk about it. Well, just, I mean, let me just you got to say, say something because you're a big Clemson fan. I am a big Clemson fan, <clears throat> and uh, South Carolina wore us out. We could, we could not stop their third string running back, their backup quarterback. <laughs> we could not stop them on third down. They ran. I mean, the SEC had a great day. They did. Swept they really, the ACC. Yeah, they really did. Uh, however, I will say this. Uh, that if you compare Clemson and Alabama's schedule, I know your immediate response will be, well, Alabama's played a much tougher schedule. But if you compare the records of their opponents, exactly the same. But uh, well, thank you, Heath. Thank you. I just that's all I want to say. Clemson, uh, happy Chick Fil A Bowl. Great job. <laughs> all right, and we have a winner. I understand. Yes, congrats to. Pastor Elizabeth Bentley in Asheboro, North Carolina. She has won a copy of James Emery White's What They Didn't Teach You in Seminary. We'll be getting her address and getting that out to her today. All right. Today we want to welcome Dr. Phil Stevenson to the show. Phil has an extensive background in coaching denominational leaders, pastors, and church planters. He has consulted on church growth and multiplication issues with a variety of denominations, including the Wesleyan Church, the Nazarene Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, Free Methodist Church, and the Evangelical Church. Phil has conducted seminars all across North America on leadership, strategic (coughs) change, church planting, church growth, evangelism, and missional church initiatives. He has spoken at conferences in North America, Australia, Mexico. Phil's an adjunct professor for Oklahoma Wesleyan University. He's taught as a visiting professor at Indiana Wesleyan University, Ohio Christian University, Southern Wesleyan University, and Kingswood University. Phil's written four books, The Ripple Church, Five Things Anyone Can Do to Lead Effectively, Five Things Anyone Can Do to Help Their Church Grow, and Five Things Anyone Can Do to Help Start a New Church. He has had articles published in a variety of periodicals, including Group Magazine, Wesleyan Life, American Society of Church Growth Journal, and the Great Commission Research Journal. He holds a BA degree in psychology from San Diego State University, MA degree in theology and philosophy from Point Loma Nazarene University, and a DMN from Talbot School of Theology. Phil, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's going to be a part of your 182nd show. Is that some kind of a special event, or do we get prizes? Everyone is a special <clears throat> event. <It's, laughs> as always, it's in the mail, Phil. It's yeah. on the way. Yes. Yes. Oh, perfect. I'll look for that. Then. That's wonderful. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, listen, real quick, we had fun in the pre-show talking sports, so it's kind of crazy. You're out there in Southern California, and you're a Notre Dame fan. I'm a Notre Dame fan. We're number one, and so bring on whoever uh, between Alabama and Georgia, and we'll, uh, for the next 42 days here, how there's no way that Notre Dame can beat one of those schools. So yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, what's your, hey, what's your gut telling you? Who do you think you're going to end up facing? I really think that uh, I think we're going to end up facing Georgia. I oh. really do believe that they're playing a lot, a little bit better right now. They've got some of their players back who have been uh, uh, typical SEC school suspended. They've, <laughs> <laughs> they've they've come back, and so uh, I think they're playing at a high caliber. So I think they're going to pull this one out. That ought to be fun. And I've also heard others say that between the two schools, that Alabama, obviously Notre Dame matches up better with Alabama. But I think that uh, Georgia is going to end up uh, doing this thing. So we'll. We'll see. All right. Well, we'll, we're going to hold you to this, and um, I don't know what we're going to do if you're wrong, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, there's so many ways that we could go with this interview. Why don't we begin with you telling us, um, you know, just kind of the front burner issues, projects, concerns that occupy you at this point in your life. Okay. Uh, well, one of the things I think that I, I, I've really been enjoying kind of wrestling with over the last several years is actually I was in a, uh, actually when I was working on my uh, Doctor of Ministry degree, uh, Gary McIntosh, who has written oh, multiple yeah. books and um, was the, the mentor for that course, he actually said something that just intrigued me at the time. And he, and he put it this way. He said, you know, if I was to go to the doctor and get a physical today, he said, I would be considered healthy. 
for the most part, I'd be a healthy person. He said, however, if I left that, that uh, physical and went and tried to run five miles, there's no way I'd be able to do that because, because he said, because I am healthy, but I'm not fit. And he then he just made this statement, kind of whimsical. He said, I wonder if the same thing can be said for churches. Can they be healthy and not fit? Mm. And that just really intrigued me. And so over the last several years, I've been really wrestling with that whole concept of uh, the difference between a healthy church and a fit church and uh, trying to figure out what that might look like and how we might help churches become more, more fit. And because at some level, fitness describes a... Um, level of activity. You know, you can be relatively healthy uh, and sit on your couch, watch, uh, eat potato chips and watch football. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, your fitness means you have to get out and do something. And so for me, when you talk about the idea of a church being fit, is it's about how missionally engages it in its community. How is it yeah. going out and really touching people's lives where they live? So that's one of the key areas I've really been enjoying having a good time uh, kind of wrestling with, uh, writing some things about, talking to some people about, uh, throwing out some just uh, conversation points as I've met with leaders here and there about what they think about that. And so uh, it's been really a, an insightful time. In fact, Gary and I are, are slowly working on uh, what we hope will be a book that's simply right now the working title is Beyond Church uh, Health. And so um, we'll see if that really comes to fruition or not. I don't know if you're familiar or not with um, George Hunter's latest book, The Apostolic Church. Yes. Um, <clears throat> interesting read. And one of the things that he brings out in that book about church health that I hadn't really thought about, he, he talks about the importance of church health, and, and he's really clear on that. He said, I'm not not at all negative, and a matter of fact, he said in the research that he's done across the years, church health is important. He said, but I want to really highlight the fact that there is no correlation between church health and a church growing and reaching lost people. Um, right. I'm just kind of curious what you think about that. For me, I, I was teaching an evangelism class um, here at Southern Wesleyan, and that that really grabbed me because— um, I guess that I had just fi- just thought within myself, well, yeah, if you're a healthy church, that automatically means that you'd be reaching people for Christ. But that's he says that's not necessarily the case. Right. And I think part of the reason for that is because when you start talking about becoming healthy, uh, there's a time where you have to be somewhat ingrown to do that. You look at yourself, you do assessments, you begin to look. And it's very easy for a church to become uh, a navel gazing uh, and they begin to get looking at their navel all the time and, and what it's about right. us. And so I think it's very easy to lose that uh, external focus, which we need to be fit. In fact, interesting enough, uh, I was I was reading a book recently having nothing to do with the church, but it called uh, a sense of urgency. And um, uh, he was making the point in that 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 companies just become ingrown and they get worried more about themselves than the people they're supposed to serve and how easy it is to become that way for a, for a um, uh, organization. And one of the reasons is because they become very uh, complacent in who they are and based on some, and this is what's interesting to me and it really applies to churches. He said, companies can get complacent because of past successes that they've had. Yeah. And he said, and the success doesn't have to be something recent. <laughs> they could be living off of stuff they did 10 years ago and still perceive themselves as successful wow. or effective. And I thought, man, how many churches could we put in that category? Yep. When you talk about what they've done, it's always what they've done five, six, seven, ten years ago, as opposed to what they're currently doing. So I, I can see that can very easily happen. Yeah. Uh, Phil, you are no stranger to church um, planning. Can you tell the listeners about your history in this area and, and also get into the area of parenting a church? And for our listeners, uh, you know, one of the great resources that I got from the, de- the denomination was the five things anyone can do to help start a, a new church. And that's something that our church is looking at. You know, we're hoping to give all our board, you know, members a copy of this. But we just just talk about what what, why is church planning and parenting churches so important? 
Well, first of all, real, real quick, uh, kind of a Twitter version of my history on this. I, I was not an advocate of, of church planting. I'm a convert to church planting. Mm, yeah. And the main reason for that, I believe, is that uh, in, in my age group, which is maturing all the time, uh, when, when we went through our, our training for uh, uh, evangelism and, and that kind of thing, we were trained in attractional evangelism. It was about getting people to come to you and, and trying to put on a good, a good effective show for them that. And then, frankly, I was on staff uh, for uh, uh, six years at Skyline Church when John Maxwell was the pastor there, and we were about growing a larger and larger church. And so I thought that's what it was about, that you grew larger churches. And and then it was through a process that, that God began to grab a hold of my heart to see communities that I, I know that even if the church that at the time that I was an assistant pastor on was to grow larger and larger and larger, there were all these communities that we would no way have people drive to us to participate. And I began to think, what do we do to reach those those people? And then through a process, which I won't go into all the details, God brought me to a point to say, you got to start churches in those areas. And at the time, my only, my only paradigm for church planting was you take a guy, a family, you drop them out in this church uh, area, they say, start a new church, didn't provide them any resources, and you said, good luck to you. And if they did well, you claimed them. If they didn't, you said, well, they just didn't have it. And so, yeah. uh, I, and I thought, I wanted no part of that. And and then God began to help me realize, hey, you you lead a church. Maybe your how can your church help with that? And so we began to go down that road of trying to see how we could help start churches out of our out of our church. And at the time, there was limited resources on helping a church know how to start a church out of its, itself at the same time. Well, actually, today, there's still very limited resources for that. There's a lot of stuff on church planting, mm. but minimal on helping an existing church chart a church. And then I began to realize, and I really believe this in my core, that if you're really going to have a church multiplication movement, it has to be driven by a local church. And so that was my journey of of doing that. And so we began to uh, pray, prepare, and uh, figure out how we might be able to to do that. And so um, we were very fortunate to be able to participate in starting several churches over a span of time. And and that's been a a, was a was a wonderful uh, opportunity for us. Um, real, real quick, just to uh, share with people, there, there's actually a link on the Westland website where they can get a PDF copy of the five things anyone can do to help start a church. And let me just share real quick what those five things are, because I, I think you said it right, Phil. There hasn't been a lot of resources on Daughter in a Church. And these are five simple things. Number one, go public. Two, generate prayer. Three, give promotion. Four, generously provide. And five, uh, grant uh, permission. How have you seen those five things play out um, in real life, in like the flesh and blood context of parenting a church? Um, first of all, let me say say this: is that uh, I, I, the reason that book was written is because I wanted churches to know that any church of any size can help start new churches. Right. Now, the the reality of it is, can every church daughter a church? That's for one church uh, themselves. Uh, uh, in essence, uh, brace a church planter, bring them along, get alongside them, and then invest people out to go with them to help start a new church. The reality is not every church can do that, sure. but every church can participate in, in starting new churches. And so that's where that, that came from. And and where that fleshes out is that, first of all, when I, when I talk about the, the go public part of it, is the fact that so often leaders are unwilling to go on the record that they want to see a, a participate in helping start new churches and they keep it kind of a secret and then when the time comes and they begin to talk about it with their uh, their folks uh, they wonder what where's this coming from and so going public is very simple it's it's talking about church planting it's mm-hmm. putting church plant as a value good. it yeah. is preaching about church planting because you look in scripture there was a that's how the, the church began to expand was through starting new churches right, right. and so um, that's the public part of that so pastor just begin to to talk about that maybe at times have church planters come in that they put them in front of their congregation. Maybe uh, they may not be their church planter, but a church planter. And they just talk about that in, 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 in different and various forms. Prayer becomes huge because of what, what people pray about is what they're usually passionate about. Mm-hmm. And so to get people to pray for uh, unreached communities and to get people to pray for just, again, general church planting and those kinds of things. And those are things a church of any size can begin to do. And um, the, the, the provision part of it is just simply providing 
providing opportunity for people in their church to either give or go in a for a church plant. Mm. And many times what pastors don't realize is unless they say it's it's okay, right. uh, people don't think about it. You know, they think they're being disloyal to their church. Yeah. Uh, and so the pastor really has to say, you, you've got permission to do that. So that that short little book, and, and frankly, I'll be honest, I didn't know it was in a PDF version, so it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's great. Surprise! Uh, yeah, <laughs> I see. And so, uh, but I, I've been, as I've talked to different churches at different times, uh, that has been a really good resource for them, at least to get their churches. Some of them put it in the hands of their leadership team and read it, and then they realize, hey, maybe we can do something to help start a new church. Uh, Phil, I, I also assume that you would kind of say the same thing if you find yourself in a denominational structure, that if this is something that we value, then it has to be valued at the general level. It has to be valued mm-hmm. at the district level, and, and these things have to be talked about at those levels. Exactly. Exactly. And good news is that you're starting to see that happen. You, you know, used yeah. to be we would talk about it and then there was no, uh, frankly, there was not much uh, uh, oomph behind it. It was just more of a talking uh, point as opposed to an action point. And now we're starting to see more and more uh, that becoming a genuine acted out value across our movement, which is, is a good thing and a positive thing. And we're not there yet. And that's where it really comes back to the whole idea of church fitness, because a fit church will be a, a multiplying church. Mm. And so so um, we, we have to continually drive and put on the value that we want churches to help start churches any way that they can. Uh, now, the reality of it is in our movement, like most movements, uh, when it comes right down to it, we still have a tendency to give a bigger applause yeah. to uh, churches that are large and that kind of thing. And we have to learn to applaud the churches a little bit more intentionally who are helping start new churches. But as I heard in a, a line in a movie not too long ago, I, a guy said, well, I guess if we wanted applause, we'd join the circus. So uh, <laughs> sometimes when we uh, drive the uh, church planting multiplication model, uh, the leaders have to know probably right out the shoot, you're not going to get a lot of applause. So yeah. that's just reality. Um, Phil, you're also very active in, in coaching. What does coaching look like for people in ministry and why might someone want a coach? Well, I, I think what a coach, coaching to me uh, is I have seen uh, uh, in our pastors out in the, I'm out in the Pacific Southwest District, which includes California, Arizona, Nevada, and uh, New Mexico. And, and we took all of our pastors through a two-day basic coaching training, well, as many as we could get together to do this. And I have seen it transform these guys, first of all, in their working with their, their leaders. As I've talked to these guys. He said, it changes how I do personal evangelism. It's changed how I, how, how I develop my leaders. It's changed how I work with people who come to counseling. It's just, it's been a change because they've learned to ask good questions. I, I think why people should consider having a coach is because... A coach helps see a different perspective. The idea of a good coach is to be able to ask good questions and also help a leader to begin to think for themselves. So often we're looking for that quick fix and we're looking for somebody to come and tell us, boom, boom, what what to do. And and so coaching allows us to be able to help a a leader through questions, to think through a process, and then to begin to become a problem solver, not just a seeker of of answers. And so the more they have the ability to solve problems, of course, the more effective they become in their in their leadership. Mm-hmm. And so I, I see it as a, a huge value. Um, I've been a, a privileged to coach others. And frankly, I have intentionally sought out different people to coach me in different areas uh, that I'm working through, whatever, and just the questions I ask. Now, that being said, I think sometimes there's a time where you just Give them an answer. <laughs> uh, you, you sometimes just say, "Hey, we've we've had." Uh, in fact, I had a young man recently because I believe a, a fair question deserves a fair answer. If someone comes and they have a question, and they, it's a good question, it's a fair question, it deserves an answer. And so I had a young man come to me and ask me a question about him starting his graduate work, and he really wanted my opinion on that because where he was in his ministry and the time it would take and all those kinds of things. And my response to him was. I'm going to give you your answer, but before I do, let me give you about five or six questions that you are going to need to answer at yeah, some point. Yeah. And then after giving those, and this is all done through email, by the way, after doing that, I said, now, 
my opinion is boom. Yeah. <laughs> and I gave yeah. him my opinion. So that to me was a good balance between answering a, a, a fair question and also being trying to be a better coach with that situation. How would you uh, see the difference between a mentor and a coach? Well, I, I think that the, the, the biggest difference, uh, and they obviously bleed over into one another all sure. the time. A, a mentor is, is more of a relational resource with somebody. Uh, not that a coach isn't, but a mentor is more of a relational resource to somebody and a little bit more of a giver of answers, to be honest with you, okay, more of someone sure. who shares, okay, this is what I think, this is what my experience dictates uh, to to you in this situation. A coach is more of really trying to work on getting them, again, as I mentioned, to think through issues. I, you can do peer coaching. Sometimes a mentor typically is someone who has been more experienced and a little bit more mature in age that they can help with their uh, someone who they're mentoring. Uh, I try to combine both. I'm in a, a couple of mentoring relationships with some young men who've asked me to mentor them, and uh, I just tell them two things. I said, one, you have to initiate the, convert, the contact, and you also have to come with the questions. Now, however, in that process, I many times will, instead of just coming and saying, giving them answers to their questions, I also will say, well, let me give you questions that you need to, that, that will help me understand better yeah. to answer your questions. So it's that continual ebb and flow of mentoring, coaching, that kind of thing. Yeah. Listen, I, I talked a little bit in the pre-show here. You know, I've been in district leadership for um, over a decade now. And I can tell you that one of the issues that constantly arises is for pastors is the issue of conflict. Many, I, I don't know of any that have said to me, wow, when I took my pastorate, I really felt prepared to deal with conflict. Um, exactly. Yeah, you, you got an article here um, confronting people with, uh, with care. Uh, talk a little bit about conflict and, and um, just some of the things that you bring out in that article. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me say this. I think that that conflict in a in a in a church is avoided when a pastor learns how to confront correctly. Mm. I think the reason conflict arises is because a pastor is either unwilling or unable or not prepared to confront people uh, when when necessary, and then conflict begins to re re bubble up because people begin to. Uh, basically talk to each other because we yeah. have a tendency in the church world especially want to talk uh, about people instead of two people <laughs> and right. so yeah. uh, i think confrontation helps with that so first of all i think a pastor has to recognize a couple things one is they were going, they're going to have to be confronters number one secondly they really need to confront within their personality some people are a little bit more aggressive and they can confront a little bit more easily but uh, regardless of your personality you need to be able to be a lovingly confronter and uh, so what I tried to bring out in that article is just a, a couple of things and I, and I just real quickly give an overview of the the eight guidelines I provided one was just to simply make sure you talk to the right person the right context yeah. sometimes even pastors have a tendency not to talk to the right person <laughs> And so that's important. And then the right, the right context, which is the right uh, the timing along with that. Uh, I think you have to make a conscious decision to never respond in anger. Uh, pastors get angry. If they don't, God bless them. But I know <laughs> I did. And I had situations where I knew if I was to confront it right then, I would have said something yeah. I know I shouldn't have said. Then I'd right. have to get in the apology mode. And yeah. so I just had to give myself time to, to decompress in that situation. But then it's to get the facts. Sometimes we hear something, and instead of going and saying, let me get a little bit more about this, um, and that takes a, a little bit of work. And I, I remember one time in a church I was pastoring, I had our worship leader come up to me and said, I just got this petition. I said, you got a what? I got this petition. I said, what do you mean you got this petition? They said, well, one of the Sunday school classes given this petition to me about why they don't like the music we're doing and we should do different music. And I said, and I, and I literally grabbed it out of her hand. I said, I'll take care of this. And I knew <laughs> I had to wait at least 24 hours before I began to, yeah. to deal with this. And then the next day it was phone calls to key leaders in that Sunday school class to gather the facts of what was said, where this petition come from, mm. blah, blah, blah. And then once I had those, then I could make sure, frankly, and at the point I knew I could talk to the right person and all those kinds of things. So get facts. You got to identify the core issues, whatever those may be, what's bothering the people, whatever it has to be. Uh, and this is another thing that's important. And, and again, you're, uh, I, you have a tendency, we have to see, not just hear what people are saying, because sometimes people may say something and they come across some way, but if you begin to really look at how they're saying it, you realize there's yep. issues there that yep. have to be addressed. 
Uh, we also have to make sure we separate the issue from the person. Mm. Uh, sometimes the, the issue needs to be confronted. The person just is, uh, it, it's not, sometimes in reality it is, sometimes it is, but a lot of times in, in, in conflict resolution or confrontation, it really isn't personal necessarily. Uh, so, um, and then uh, timing is critical. Like I mentioned, when do you do it? Do you wait? Do you do it right away? And then frankly, at the end, you clarify expectations when it's all said and done. What, what are the expectations of you and the person you're confronting? Uh, typically, what I would, would say in some kinds of issues of confrontation, say now, based on this situation, here's what should happen. Yeah. Here's what I expect not to happen. And if this does happen again, we're going to have another opportunity to have a conversation. It may not be as pretty as this one. <laughs> sure. So uh, th that those are things that have been helpful to me yeah. in my, my ministry and working with people. Yeah, good, good practical stuff. Phil, it has been absolutely amazing having you on the show today. Before we let you go, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you think kind of is right there on the that needs to be on the front burner for for church leaders and pastors? Well, I think one thing I like to share real real briefly is that I really want to encourage church leaders to begin to move from trying to be successful mm. to being effective. Mm. And the reason for that is because success typically puts us in competition. So we look at whatever our definition of success and we say, okay, am I better than that? Am my church bigger than that person? Is Bob, you know, whatever it might be. And so it becomes a competition. And yet if we look and we switch to being more effective, effectiveness is basically doing what God has called us to do where has he called us to do it with the resources he's given us to do that? If we're doing that, we're effective, even though what people may perceive as successful may not be that. It, yeah. We're just being effective. And if I could tell a very quick um, uh, antidote to that, I, I knew a guy years ago. His name was Chuck. He lived in San, it was when I was in San Diego. He worked with a juvenile detention facility in San Diego. And, and he had a rough ministry. And, and frankly, people weren't coming to Christ or the whole thing. And so finally I said to Chuck, I said, Chuck, how do you stay encouraged? Because I said, I see what you do and I'm not even doing it. And I get discouraged for you. I said, how do you get, how do you stay encouraged? And he said, well, you know, the scripture where some water and some plant and some sow. Yeah. He, I said, well, of course. And he said, well, I just furrow the ground. <laughs> he said, I just try to till the soil in the hearts of these young men and women. And he says, even though I have not had much affection to them many times that I've had people come back to me and said, because of Chuck, of who you were at a right time in my life, I came to Christ later on, and I thought to myself, yeah. man, that guy understands his effectiveness. Yeah. He, he may not look successful, what we would call his success, but he was really being effective. And I really would encourage pastors to do that because uh, it's, it's, it's tough in ministry today. Probably the, We have the most difficult, the most opportunistic times ever in ministry and we're in right now. So strive for effectiveness, not just success. That would be yeah. my last little thought. Well, well put, Phil. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, I think I pronounced this right, uh, the Sisu Group, uh, which you can find online, the thesisugroup.org. Talk a little bit about some of the services you guys offer. Okay. Uh, the Sisu Group, Sisu is a Finnish word. My maternal grandmother is from Finland. Mm. And uh, Sisu is a part of the Finnish culture, which actually means there's no real good definition. It means intestinal fortitude or guts. And I've always <laughs> loved that little <laughs> word. So that's where that comes I love from. It. And uh, so what, what the sister group does is basically uh, primarily an area of coaching, uh, doing consulting, and also doing training for, for organizations for leadership and those kinds of things. Out of that also comes a, a resource called The Rock and the Pond, which uh, the article uh, that Tony alluded to was one of those. That comes out twice a week via, uh, it, it both can be found on the website, and it also can be sent out uh, via uh, 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 email type of thing that goes out twice a week. And, and that deals with leadership issues and, and those kinds of things. Uh, so uh, we try to provide as many resources as we can in the area, primarily of leadership, whether it, uh, it, it uh, kind of flows into church leadership or it can flow into business leadership. But basically, I guess leadership would be the core. And our, our little phrase is courageous leadership for challenging times. And so that's what we try to offer and um but coaching consulting training would be the three key aspects of that we'll make sure we put that link on our website phil thanks so much for yeah, taking time out well, we just realize that you know people's schedules are busy when they give us their time it's a gift to us and so thanks so much well thank you gentlemen i enjoyed it and we do this again down the road that'd be awesome all right yeah. good luck to your irish 
All right. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Oh, well, I got an amen on that one. <laughs> Uh, all right. Hey, this is a good week. We had some good response through um, emails, uh, voicemails. And so um, I think TG has some of yeah, these. Yeah, here, let's listen to, let me get the camera set up here. Here here's comes the first one. This is Paul Tillman. I just wanted to congratulate Anthony on making it through a whole show interviewing Dr. Joanne Lyon and not slipping up and calling her Joe Lyon, although I would have loved to have seen her face when he said that. Have a good day, guys. Bye. See, it makes me wonder if, like, someone in the past has called her Joe Lyon. Yeah, I don't know. know. There might be a story behind that. (laughs) Yeah. But, yay, a voicemail. Now, (laughs) if you ever wondered, I'm just so happy because last week, my buddy Seth Cotton made my dreams come true. Oh, yes. And here's his voicemail. Just wanted to wish you guys a happy Thanksgiving and fulfill TG's dream of getting a phone call on this line. Hope you guys have a good week. Thanks for all you do. Bye. So, if, if... Seth had a byline, like a like a tagline for himself. Mm-hmm. Seth Cotton, making your dreams come true. <laughs> that's, that, it didn't, that's Disney. Didn't. Isn't it? <laughs> Hello, my name is Tedro. Go vote for me. I make all your dreams come true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, seriously though, thank you for for sending in your comments. We love to hear what you're thinking about. Oh, and, yeah. uh, even if you had further up thoughts for the show, I know we got an email from Seth as well with yeah. further thoughts from last week's show. Do you have any of that? Yeah, or? yeah. I just took his email and forwarded it. He had some great questions um, uh, about domestic violence, things of that nature. Yeah. So we have forwarded that to the general superintendent's office, and yes. Lord willing, we'll have a response to that. I would just amen what um, Matthew said about voicemails. Um, we love hearing from you, but you can also take, uh, you know, the second part of our show is very opinionated. I mean, we're just, you know, it's the three of us, and we have our opinions about things. And we're no- normally right about we're things. Always right. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you may think that we're not always right. And so use our voicemail as um, yeah, to disagree with us or agree. Agree, uh, disagree, give us your opinions. Maybe there's there are other resources that we need to know about. One of the things that we love to do on this show is get resources in the hands of people in ministry. Yeah. And so if we have an occasion where we mention a resource, and you say, hey, I know of another thing that's similar, Yes. Uh, leave us a voicemail and tell us about that, and we will gladly play your comments on the air. All right, let's move on to... What? The next thing. Oh, that thing. Download of the week. <laughs> Download of the week. Yeah. So, uh, our download of the the week is uh, 100 zeros. Now, I asked Heath when he got here today to go ahead and hit the link on this. Yes. um, And And, um, and just tell him what you found. uh, It is basically a a listing of free books you can get on Amazon uh, for mostly through the Kindle. And just in show prep, I probably downloaded about 20 books. Some of them are classic books. Uh, now, I do want to make people aware that it is just like being on Amazon, that a lot of the things that are on there are not endorsed or promoted by our show, <laughs> so be careful, but a lot of great, a lot of great books, um, and on the right-hand side, there's a menu. Yep, categories. You can go by a category. Um, so, yeah, I mean... And, this is an uh, awesome site. I found about, <laughs> I, I, I ran across this last night, and... Someone has done a great job of curating free Kindle books. Now, you hit one book that was it, it wasn't free. It's like a dollar. So right, right. So watch uh, it, some of them. It, it sounds, <clears throat> it seems like this, this is something that rotates. Uh, yeah. Amazon does go through every now and then and make uh, books free for a time. Right. Yeah. And uh, but a great, great. Uh, the best website. The best website I have found so far that has curated free Kindle books. Yeah. By far the best that I've seen. So yes. take advantage of that. All right, let's see what they said. Read my lips. I'm going to say this again. I've never taken steroids or HGH. I took the initiative in creating the Internet. The Macintosh, of all the machines I've ever seen, is the only one that meets that standard. Well, I'm not a crook. If you if you know what you're doing here, slide slide out. The economy has shown gradual improvement in recent years, but everyday Americans are still working hard to cover expenses, making holiday spending particularly stressful. Ken Rees, CEO of Think Finance, offering his opinion and reaction to a poll they sponsored 
where 45% of respondents would rather skip Christmas. Source, CNBC. Churchgoers indicate much lower agreement related to sacrificial giving. Just 9% of churchgoers strongly agree with the statement, quote, I intentionally give up certain purchases so I can use that money for others, end quote. 30% somewhat agree and 32% disagree. Ed Stetzer commenting on recent research that seems to suggest a correlation between selflessness and spiritual maturity. Source, the Lifeway Research Blog. Perhaps there would be less fraud in the church if church criminals were required to pay back full restitution. Church members spent more time praying for church leaders, and more discernment was used in choosing church employees and church officers. Barry Bowen, blogger for the Christian Post, suggesting that Christian leaders, church leaders who steal funds from their followers be held to the biblical principle of restitution. Source, the Christian Post. We're not saying anything bad about Charlie Brown. The problem is that it's got religious content, and it's being performed in the religious venue. And that doesn't just blur the line between church and state. It oversteps it entirely. Ann Orsi, a Little Rock attorney and vice president of the Arkansas Society of Freethinkers, opposing Terry Elementary School's plan to bus kids to Agape Church to see the production of A Charlie Brown Christmas. Participation is voluntary, and parents must pay for the gas to bus the kids to the church. Source, Fox News. Alrighty, yeah. <laughs> Yay. Uh, so 45% want to skip Christmas. Yes, I'm actually uh, going to a link now. Uh, CNN said uh, a record 247 million shoppers visited stores and website on Black Friday. So basically they said essentially all adult Americans went shopping on Black Friday. But, so you uh, disagree with this? No, I agree. With, I, well, here, here's what I'm saying. It was, it was a poll of 1,000, okay? so uh, it, it, Well, it, here's, here's what I'm saying is... People are saying this, and they're still going shopping. It doesn't make sense to me because people are like, we ain't got money for Christmas. Oh, we're going to get it first in line. Well, yeah, I put this story in our lineup because our Sunday school teacher reminded us this week that that the holidays for a lot of people is just right. a bummer time for them. Yep. Suicides in the United States peak at this time of year. And so one of the challenges that she issued to the whole class was to really have our antennas up this year, mm. be sensitive to this, and find people, find someone. And she said, actively pray for that. Pray yeah. the Lord to reveal someone to you um, who's struggling during the holidays that you can help lift the load and, and make this uh, a, a good uh, Christmas season for them. So, um, and, and in this one here, I mean, if... As you would guess, I mean, Reese, who's the CEO of Think Finance, th this one, this whole poll was totally financed. And so yeah. people are still feeling the pressure. And for parents who can't afford mm -hmm. to get what they want to get for their kids, I mean, yeah. it's kind of a, a bummer. And kids, it's not like kids are isolated. Yeah. They go to school after the holidays and, you know, they start comparing stories. Right. You know? Right. And I, I think, you know, a, a lot of people who, who, and I think, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, it, it does draw in people who are looking for deals. And and not and I'm not talking about big-ticket items. I'm talking about, you know, um, well, I, I can't say some of the stuff my wife bought because my kids may watch this and find out what they're getting for Christmas. I they watch every episode. Hit. They, Anything you I ever have do been, online. I have been <laughs> quite surprised. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I think, um, you know, it's just, you know, it is tough, and I think you're right. You know, the church needs to be so sensitive um, to that. And I think, you know, both these first two stories really kind of go hand in hand um, of if, um, you know, Ed Stetzer talking about that there's a correlation between oh. self, selflessness and spiritual maturity goes hand in hand with, you know, who are we spending money solely on ourselves this Christmas, or are we helping... Uh, others out. I mean, this goes right along with uh, the book Soul Shift. There's a chapter in there, Consumer to Steward. Yep. I mean, this... Yeah, you know. Ed Stetzer, this poll here, 9%. Now, yeah. get, get this. These are all believers who are taking this. 9% agree with the statement, I intentionally give up certain purchases 
so yeah. I can use that money for others. Now, I found that appalling, right. but then I found it convicting yeah. when I began <laughs> yeah. to ask myself right. that question. Right. And so in relation to the first story, right. it became a real point of conviction. And so, like, I mean, as I sit here right now, I mean, I'm really stirred within about this whole thing. And, and, and so, I mean, there's a great connection with these two stories. I would, I think, that that something that that churches need to touch more on is just financial maturity, financial responsibility. Because how many how many young people graduate from college? They have student loans. Maybe they've uh, accumulated some stupid credit card debt, and so they enter adulthood. They enter marriage, and you know seventy five percent of their pay goes to oh. pay off debt. Right. And when you're doing that, yeah. you you know, you if you meet somebody that you would love to help out, you you can't. You can't. Because you've made bad yeah. Yeah. financial no, decisions no, listen, beforehand. I, there was a guy at Asbury by the time he by the time he got to Asbury, he was single, he owed fifty thousand dollars in school loans. And I mm. said, What are you gonna do? And he was studying for the ministry. Yeah. Mm. I said, What are you gonna do? And he talked about doing something other than ministry, and I began to laugh. And I said, of course you're going to do something other than ministry because you have priced yourself right out of yeah. the church. There's no yeah. way that you're going to be able to service your loans by being in the ministry, at least in, in, in our denomination. Right. I'm just being frank. In the Wesleyan yeah. Church, there was no way yeah. that he was going to be able to sustain that. I think that the jewel in this second story also is this, that the research seems to suggest that there is a correlation yeah. between selflessness and our spiritual maturity when we begin to make this connection. And this is the whole thing of, I mean, this is the, this is the economics of Jesus. If you want to live, mm -hmm. you're going to have to die. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's the economy of the kingdom. There's I a think great chapter it, in a book called Soul Shift, too, about yeah. <laughs> yeah. consumer to steward. Yeah. There, I think <laughs> if... Um, if every pastor studied their financial records of, of who gives and who doesn't, most pastors would not be surprised because I, I think most Christians, their level of um, generosity inside the church is matched outside the church. What I mean by that is somebody who gives sacrificially to tithe they're going to find a way to help somebody. Oh, I agree. And somebody who is when, when the Lord taps them on the shoulder, <laughs> right? Somebody who doesn't tithe, they're not helping anybody. I mean, that's just being blunt. But uh, well, you're painting with a broad brush, but probably most of the time that's that's a, a correct analysis. And they need to be hit you know. with a broad brush. All right, the third the third story here. I love this because Barry Bowen he is he, he's saying, hey, I, I got this radical idea. And it was from the Mosaic Law, and that is. Um, you know, restitution was huge in the Old Testament. You steal yeah. from someone, you're going to make restitution. Oh, yeah. And it's yeah. sometimes fivefold. Yeah. So, so you stole this. And, you know, I, I got I actually preached within the past year a sermon on, or it was a kind of a, more of a series on forgiveness. And it used to be that you would preach. There were, there are, like, if you go back, yes. uh, not, not more than 100 years, there were major sermons on restitution yeah. and that word was used a lot and it's a word that i hadn't really heard until i was an adult and i, I think my my three basic things where repentance leads to reconciliation we talk about a whole lot and that is important but what about restitution what is yeah. what's what's involved there on a personal level i think this is a I mean, yeah, this is a great... Well, and Bowen talks about Jim Baker and the whole PTL thing, and there were people who lost tens of thousands of dollars, and by the court order, by court order, um, Baker was made to pay back an average of $6.54 per person. <laughs> and so, I mean, part of me says there's no way that Baker could ever pay back the money that was embezzled, you know, and that was taken to that whole organization, but... But he shouldn't be making more <laughs> money on right. television right now. <laughs> well, I know yeah. I know of two separate uh, situations local to this area. One where uh, you know a guy was stealing money from the church. He actually created a business that included the name of the church. So he was taking people's checks, and he would just add. It was like 
the, his business was name of the church. He would add a zero at the end, and and he would add he would add the, you know, uh, the name of his business. Oh, it was okay. like nursery, so okay. it was like blank church nursery, and uh, he got caught and, and, and is in jail. Zero restitution. My my parents actually were um, kind of uh, involved in that. In that, you know, several of their checks were stolen or whatever. Uh, but then also found flip side of that found uh, heard it know of a local church that did not press charges but came under an agreement with the the person involved the the the, the thief and their family and made a restitution yeah. plan and that is being followed and I thought that was a pretty cool <laughs> pretty cool thing very redemptive of the person it is yeah. um I believe the the, yeah. the person is still in the church. Obviously, is not involved in any of the financial aspects <laughs> of the church. But I thought that was a really cool thing. Um, I just I, I I sense that we have <clears throat> talked about forgiveness or repentance and reconciliation and just stopped there. Yeah. And you think that once once we've reconciled or once we've said. <laughs> I have sinned or whatever, you know, it is that, that kind of like, okay, so we're forgiven and that's, yeah. that's good. But anytime there's a wrong, there's a debt. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there's, there's this is a, a point you made big, yeah. there's, there's beautifully a, made. there's a debt that somebody has to pay. Yeah. Somebody has to pay it. If I came, well, an illustration I use is if I came to your house, over to your house, and even if it was unintentional, knocked over a lamp and broke your lamp at your house, somebody carries the weight of that debt debt of wrong now that's an example of something that doesn't not a perfect illustration but right. for what it is either you'll say i forgive you for doing that and we are still friends that's reconciliation but in that reconciliation the owner of the lamp is bearing the debt right or the the the, the person who owns the lamp says i can't believe you would come over to my house and break my lamp this relationship is over there is no reconciliation there is no restitution on that or the person who broke the lamp says i will pay to replace that lamp somebody's got to Someone. somebody's got to foot the bill and we stop at reconciliation yeah. uh, but there's there are there is a biblical principle of restitution yeah. uh that's that that yeah i never heard about i just yeah. i mean i just never heard that we, we had a local judge here in the upstate there was a small church never ran more than about 30 people during a period a decade where they had a treasure a certain treasure and a church of 30, over nine years, the treasurer embezzled a little over $50,000. And the church was going to be forgiving about it. There were those in the church who were saying, no, we shouldn't prosecute or anything. And here's what happened. The local prosecutor caught wind of it, mm -hmm. went to the church and said, we think it's noble that you don't want to charge, but we are bringing charges. We, you know, the, the local right. prosecutor brought charges. The judge said, you will pay restitution. You'll work out a plan. You're going to come back here in a few months. They came back. There was a plan. You're going to come back in two years, so you're going to pay 5000 in the next two years, and you're going to take two years to figure out how you're going to pay the other 45000 um, The treasurer came back and said, well, I'm not, there's just no way I can pay the $45,000 back. Put him in jail. Wow. Put him in jail. Wow. Um, and, and, and took that right out of the church's hand. Yeah, and, and the the judge was so offended by it to say you, those funds have to be replaced. I feel like the heart of true repentance in the believer or somebody who's seeking mm -hmm. to to make something right will not just seek reconciliation; they'll seek restitution. Yeah. Um, now there are some people who carry that overboard, and a part of forgiveness is being forgiven. A part of that is, I mean, even in our relationship with the Lord, we can't make restitution for ourselves it is something that is a a gift of forgiveness right. that we could never bear that debt for yeah. and yet there is a portion of this that say because because you have forgiven that debt for me wow my life just owes a debt of gratitude and it's not that i'm trying to work to pay off a debt but i'm working to say i, I honor that one who paid that debt for me but that's us and the Lord, us and people, 
Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're kind of two, two, two different attitudes. The heart right. of the one who is forgiving yeah. and the heart of the one who wants to be forgiven. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and attitude. I think, I think the heart of the, uh, the heart of the one who wants to be forgiven is a heart of, Rest- of seeking. If you can seek restitution. To make it right. Yes, exactly. No, I, I totally agree. All right. Let's see this last story here. So a Charlie Brown Christmas, yeah. Terry elementary school, little rock, Arkansas. This is voluntary. Kids don't have to go, but if you, if you, if you want your kid to go to the agape church, where they're going to be performing a Charlie Brown Christmas. You give um, $2 per kid. Your parent has to pay, and they'll shuttle a bus over there, and your kid can watch it. And so the the Free Thinker Society are saying, no, this is a violation of church and state. I think what confused me at the beginning is I didn't realize this was a production. I was thinking they're going to drive over there and just watch the movie. But <laughs> no, play. the fact that this, it's is a play. A, this is a production, I think um, – well, you know what I think. They're not I, being made to do it. I mean, right, my, right. My Total voluntary. Is, it's totally voluntary. If if I, as a parent, don't want my kid exposed to that, yeah. then I can say to the kid, now, I would know that the art. So the argument to that is, oh, great. So my little Johnny has to stay back at school while all the other 23 kids go, you know. And, and so my kid's going to feel bad, and, and my kid's going to feel like they're being punished. What's he going to feel? He's going to get a free day. He's not going to have to do anything. <laughs> He's going to be there, going to get to go to recess. Well, well, do it. you think I exaggerate it? I mean, don't you think that would kind of be some of the reaction? Oh, it would be. I can, oh, I yeah. can tell you because I, I both know and have had to sit out of things in public school. What uh, what offends okay. what offends me a lot of times no is <laughs> that is that people are so quick to say we need more arts in the school we need all this but then but any type of Christian art or like a musical presentation or a drama presentation it's like no oh, no nope, nope, that's not what me well I've always let's said just that back this truck up a little bit all right back it up go ahead the pl- dee, dee, dee. how close. <laughs> Charlie Brown Christmas. Yes, great Linus quotes from Rock. Luke, yeah. Luke's Gospel. Yeah. Um, Lights, please. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I just like I just don't fully get it. I guess they wouldn't let their kid watch the cartoon on TV either. Probably. Yeah, I don't know because I I, I think I, or t- they have to cut that portion out of the newspaper. You know, when it's the resyndicated peanuts. Classic peanuts, cut yeah. that out because those cr- peanuts are Christian. No, I don't think that's. Uh, yeah, I, I I think that the school has taken all the proper steps. Right. Um, you, yeah. you, you, parents, you have to provide money if you want your kid to go. This is totally voluntary. You don't have to go. Yes, we are going to be using the public school bus, but all the you know you're paying for that. You know, we're not offering that as a free service to you. The taxpayer is not going to pick up that tab. You yeah. have to pick that up. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I. Let, let's also. I, let's, I'm saddened by it. Let, uh, you know, part of the story we haven't talked about. Let's let me personally give kudos to Agape Church. Uh, I don't know if they're doing this. If this is a production that they're doing, you know, on the weekends and it's open to the public. But whoever made the contact to say, "Hey, man, elementary kids may enjoy this." I mean, I think this is a great, uh, not just a great outreach. Obviously, if they're doing Charlie Brown Christmas. The, the Christmas story is, is being presented, but also just to expose kids to, hey, we're not all a bunch of crazy people. Right. Uh, this well, is I, the, I just the, wonder where the contention is. Is the contention right. that you're going to church property for this, or is the right. contention that, that it is this this play? Like, what's the what's the what's Yeah, the as I understand it, it's because it's you're going to the church, and yeah. the other objection is that the play itself, I, A. Charlie Brown Christmas, the production, the yeah. book, even the cartoon, as a, is very religious. It even yeah. has scripture in it. Um, I think one of the things that's lost in this is even if you have a problem as a free thinker with the, the scripture part of this, the values that are projected in this production are great. Anyone that's yeah. watched this. And yeah. it goes exactly to what 40, whoever percent of the people who want to skip Christmas now because they feel like it's, I mean, what's Charlie Brown's yeah. thing in that? Yeah. It's that's become right. too commercialized. Right. And I get, I bet you some yeah. of those same 49% of whoever would be like, I don't know, not Charlie Brown's Christmas thing, but that's Charlie Brown's thing. <laughs> yeah. That's, it is. It's exact. That's my point. Yeah. So my, my guess is that, 
they appreciate the value yeah. of what that thing, even if you disagree with the scripture part of it, right? The value is something that the culture needs to grab hold yeah, of. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Totally agree. All right. Well, uh, listen, let's talk about what's coming up here in the future. Uh, next week, we have John Croft of Global Partners. He's going to be talking to us about the Jesus film oh, and um, awesome. also some wonderful stories that are connected with that. On December the 11th, uh, we rescheduled with Dr. Timothy Tennant. He is the president of Asbury Seminary. Um, on December the 18th, we'll have uh, Nina Rosner. If I have pronounced her name wrong, um, I ask her apology. She is the author of the book, The Respect Dare, from Thomas Nelson, and uh, she's going to join us via Skype. And Christmas Day, um, we'll be coming live from Heath's house on his iPad. <laughs> no, there's no show on Christmas Day. Um, I know that you're really surprised by that. Uh, you wanted to stop everything you were doing on Christmas. We'll however, right however I am getting ready to put one of our previous episodes on a DVD, and if you would request and send uh, your, your sponsorship gift of $100 to <laughs> yes! Yes! I will yes! Christmas wrap you an episode <laughs> from the archives. Autographed. On a DVD, uh, and you can sit at home around the Christmas tree and pop that in and watch that on Christmas make Day. The if that'll make you feel sit better. Down. Yeah, Instead right. of reading the Christmas story or watching the Charlie <laughs> Brown Christmas, you can watch you, hey, the I'll just say show. this. I mean, if we're going to sponsorship route, if you will send us a gift of <laughs> at least $50, I will read the Christmas story, <laughs> record it. And in in the voice of your choice, I you know any or of I'll read it. Here, and he can even play better. all the animal characters. Even better, yeah. even better. <laughs> we will we will do the Charlie Brown Christmas production. Yes. Keith as Charlie Brown, yes. shaved head, just one hair, <laughs> <laughs> shaved everywhere else, and a yellow shirt with a zigzag. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you do the teacher great, man. Uh, that's awesome. All right, uh, Heath, where can our listeners find you? On I'm the just, internet. I'm just trying to find myself. Uh, HeathMulligan.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I, like I've said many times, I'm the only Heath Mulligan in the world. So anything Heath Mulligan, follow me. Find me. T MatthewTG.com for me. Twitter at AKC64. If you want to do further research on anything we discussed today, you can find all the links to the stories we covered at our website, thetechnologyshow.com. If you want to contact us, send your emails to thetechnologyshow at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail by calling us at 3049-TEOLOGY. That's 304-986-5649. Leave us a message. We'll be glad to play your comments on the air. As always, thanks for joining us. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Adios.